Before we even begin this video, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna say hi. I think I have to address um, a curse that has been on me. Oh God, there's a goose hair in it. I had this idea to remake some of Sandra Lee's cocktail recipes, um, but I figured that if I just did that and had like no other content in the middle, it would just be kind of weird watching me slowly black get blackout drunk to some of her, her cocktails. Because if you haven't seen, Sandra Lee's cocktails are unhinged. And so I decided that since this video is going to be pretty long and I'm probably going to be filming it over multiple parts, I would put in some Sandra Lee cocktails. And of course I started with the classic Lush Lagoon, which you may think you haven't heard of, but you've heard of it. It is mashed up kiwi, two shots of vodka, one shot of melon liqueur, canned jalapeno juice, um, and then you're supposed to put like a floating kiwi on top as like a garnish. Oh, and simple syrup. You're supposed to put a floating kiwi on as a garnish, but it has just sunk to the bottom with the rest of the kiwi goo. It's not good, okay? Spoilers, it's not good. Anyways, now that we got that monstrosity out of the way, hi. We are about to reach like a thousand subscribers, which is crazy. Um, and so I thought I would dedicate, what's probably gonna be a very long video to a passion project of mine, if you will. Kids these days have it too easy. My hot take, I know. If a 12 year old wants to look like a baby influencer, they can just go on TikTok and find out what all the 17 year olds are doing and wearing and they can look like that too. And apparently a concerning amount of middle schoolers watch Euphoria, which just makes me worry for their psyche. I mean, I shouldn't be allowed to watch it at this point, so. But you see, I, as a 23 year old elder Zoomer, millennial cusp, had to figure out what the influencers were doing by reading. <laughs> I know. And as a child, I read not one, but all 20 click novels, 15 main books, five novellas. And this does not even include the one clictionary. This also doesn't include the manga spinoff, the movie, the Nintendo DS game, or its spinoff series, The Alphas. And my mom would look at me as a little middle schooler reading 15 books in a row and go, wow, what a young academic. Meanwhile, the book I'm reading is like, I was just wondering, Claire said, are you a female dog? What? Massey asked. Why? Because you're acting like a real bitch. Claire shot her a scowl and hurried away before Massey had time to answer. Poor Claire, Massey thought. In her world, that was probably clever. But in Massey's world, it was a big mistake. Yeah, so if you're not aware, this middle school gossip girl has the lore depth of, I would say, the MCU. And until I had this channel, I had nowhere to place this information. And thus it has been stored in my brain, purposely blocking out my ability to gain any new or more relevant information. I'm about to take the bar exam. Do I know what the rule against perpetuities is? No, I do not. Do I know the name of Massey's horse and black pug? Of course I do brownie and bean. So today I thought that I would release this information into the world onto you so I can immediately release it from my memories and you can have the burden of carrying all of this knowledge. You're welcome. Oh, it still tastes bad. Oh, it doesn't get better. Let's begin. What is the Click franchise? The Click franchise was thought out by a small mom and pop book publishing company whose mission it was to empower young women. I'm just kidding. It was written by Alloy Entertainment. And if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because you probably also fall asleep to Jenny Nicholson's The Vampire Diaries video. Alloy Entertainment is a book packaging company that will approach authors with different ideas of things that they want to get published. And Alloy Entertainment tends to specialize in the teen and tween audience. So they're responsible for various war crimes like The Vampire Diaries, Gossip Girl, Pretty Little Liars, and of course, The Click. Alloy Entertainment approached a young MTV writer named Lisey Harrison. And Lisey Harrison, when she heard this offer, was like, yeah, I'll do it as a joke. Which is funny because that's also what I say about this YouTube channel. It's just a joke. It's just ironic, guys. But Harrison's books were an immediate success. I mean, it was finally telling the story of five rich, young, white women. The representation we needed in our media. I actually had to stop recording because I can't, I can't do this anymore. I can't, I don't have to suffer like this. Seltzer water is for another cocktail recipe, but I just, I can't drink um, three. <laughs> straight shots of vodka and nothing else. I'm sorry, Sandra, I let you down. Wow, Goose is here, Goose is here. Okay, I'm gonna tell you about the click, okay? Yeah, that sound good? Okay, so Goose. The click is a series following five girls. There's Massey, Alicia, Dylan, Kristen, and Claire. Five girls attend a fancy all-girls school in Westchester, New York called Octavian Country Day. Whatever, it's... <laughs> 
The acronym is OCD, another classic zinger from Lisi. Her name isn't Lizzie. Is it meant to be pronounced Lizzie? Or Lisa? Her name throws me off anytime. Anyways, the books follow the girls engaging in complex tactical warfare and political anxiety, all to maintain their clique the Pretty Committee, which is the most popular group in school. If you need a comparison, I would say Game of Thrones or any World War One documentary on the History Channel is a pretty apt comparison. So there's something for you and my dad to bond over. Now the plot. There's no other way to present the plot to you other than to go through every single book one at a time. Um, because one does not simply skim the Bible, okay? All right, so book one, The Click. Now, as I go through these books, I'm going to mention a lot of boys' names, especially, and you do not need to pay attention to which boy is which, because most of them, I would say, are pretty interchangeable. And if they're not, I will make it clear to you. So don't worry if you forget a boy from book to book. You really just need to pay attention to the five girls. And if you've seen the Click movie, you pretty much know the plot of the first book. When the book starts, Claire's dad and Massey's dad are old friends from college, and Claire's family is moving up to Westchester, New York from Orlando, Florida. And because they can't currently afford to buy a house in Westchester, they are going to be living in Massey's guest house while they wait to find a home of their own. And Claire, at the beginning of this book, and I would argue throughout the entire series, but that's up to debate, is what the Click would call a LBR. And LBR is a loser beyond repair. According to the wiki, she's known for wearing keds, being poor, and having bangs. Like I said, Claire moved from Orlando, and I don't think that's a coincidence. A Disney adult if I've ever seen one. And as a theme park enthusiast myself, I can tell you that they are not good people. Claire in this series will cheat on her boyfriend, gaslight and catfish a group of girls, abandon her one real friend the second she finds any other options, and generally just be a very unpleasant person. But she's middle class. The franchise really wants us to root for Claire, but Claire has the same energy as like that rich person you go to college with who, Venmo's, who Venmo requests you $5 for an Uber and is always like, I'm poor. While they drop like $300 on clothes the next day, like it doesn't matter. But Massey, Massey. Massey is the actual protagonist, and I would say that she nails the female anti-hero. She's awful, problematic at times, but she's insecure. And most importantly, she's so funny. My favorite activity as a child was trying to incorporate the lines from the book that Massey would say. Try and sound like I was naturally funny and witty too, but it, it never worked in real life because I'd just be like, did I invite you to my BBQ? Because you're all up in my grill. I don't, I don't like you. Yeah, that was how middle school went for me. But Massey runs the pretty committee. And if you've ever seen House of Cards, I believe it's actually canon that she grows up to be the female lead in, in that series as well. Alicia. Alicia is the hot one of the group and she has big boobs. Alicia was always my favorite and I honestly can't remember why. I truly think it was just that I didn't know that I liked girls at the time. Anytime that she enters a room or is described, they take the time to describe her, her large boobs and so 12 year old me was probably just like, boobs. They also really take the time to describe her as a harlot. 10 year old me really thought that, but she is quite literally 12. All of these girls are 12. And Alicia, if you need a, a character comparison, I would say that she is like Marjorie Tyrell in Game of Thrones. She's not quite in power, but she wants to be. And she doesn't quite know why she wants to be, but she would kill you if that's what it required. Now, Massey's mother is a model from Spain and her father is a rich American lawyer. I believe. And Massey throughout the series will call Alicia Fanish or fake Spanish, even though Alicia is quite truly honestly half Spanish. And it's meant to be like a dig at her dad being white and her mom not being white. And later in the series, Alicia cries when Massey finds out that her father changed his last name from Rivers to Rivera so that her mom's Spanish family would accept him. Listen, my grandparents were a dark skinned Hispanic man and a white lady living in the 1960s. You can imagine, I have no tolerance for any of Massey's weird racial purity obsession. This is like objectively my least favorite thing about Massey. So I am not going out here and saying that just because I like these books that they aged perfectly. <laughs> Let's just put that out there. Throughout my research, I also looked at the Click Wiki just to sort of refresh myself on some of the plot that I had forgotten. And I took this quote from the Alicia page on the Wiki because I just thought it was so funny. It is said throughout the books that she has big boobs, yet in the movie, Claire has bigger boobs. I think CinemaSins wrote this wiki page. Now, Dylan. Dylan is the one that gave us all EDs in middle school because she is horrifically overweight at 
size six. Her and the rest of the group are constantly making jokes about her weight and her crash diets. In the movie and the books, you see Claire suggest to Dylan that she switch the tag size on her clothes so that her mother thinks that she's wearing smaller clothes than she actually is. And not only is she not a size zero, she also has red hair, but at least she's rich, so take that, Claire. Yeah, the jokes about Dylan's weight and appearance are at some points just straight up like pro-ED, and I'm not going to be referencing them throughout the rest of this video for, I, I would hope, understandable reasons, but just know that they're there. And according to Dylan's page on the wiki, she plans to be a plus-size model. Again, she is a size six. What is the average American woman? Like a size 14? Kristen is the jade of the group. She's attending OCD on a full scholarship, and although her friends don't know it in the earlier books, she actually lost all her money and is secretly poor. Her mother is also lame and doesn't let her dress the way that she wants, hence the jade thing. She also has a cat named Beckham, loves soccer, the color green, and is gay. She doesn't know that, but I do. Straight women don't wear this. And I know that because I wore this in middle school. So in the first book, the pretty committee hate Claire because she keeps trying to butt in on their little friend group and can't seem to make friends of her own. On the first day of school, they splash red paint on her pants to make it look like she got her period and generally just do like a lot of mean things to Claire. And unfortunately, Massey doesn't realize that Claire has full access to her home and could spit on any surface that she wanted to. Like, this is why you should be nice to waiters, even if you don't care about just like human decency. But Claire doesn't spit on stuff. Instead, she goes into Massey's computer and takes over Massey's IM account and starts messaging the other girls as Massey to make herself seem cooler and drive a wedge between Massey and the other girls. And eventually Claire gets Massey kicked out of the group and replaced as the alpha. Eventually Massey finds out and they kick her out of the group. And the book ends with the Pretty Committee skirting FDA regulations and making their own lip glosses, each named after a Pretty Committee member. Unfortunately, when they distribute them to their classmates, they find out that it causes pretty severe swelling and allergic reactions. And Claire ultimately saves the day by giving them oatmeal to put on their lips, which for some reason works. So the group forgives Claire, but she is not a member of the Pretty Committee just yet. Book two, best friends for never. Massey is about to throw the hottest boy-girl Halloween rager. Kristen and Dylan spend this book fighting over boy toy Derek Harrington, or as he is so-called, Darrington. Massey and the Pretty Committee decide that it would be super hot and scandalous to wear dirty devil costumes to school for Halloween. And you know how it goes. I saw Massey wearing a Dirty Devil costume, so the entire school ends up wearing Dirty Devil costumes. And the principal decides that these costumes are too sexy, and because of this, he will have to instate uniforms for the entire school. Principal Burns actually went on to work for M&Ms a few years later. I know it was him who did it. Bring her back. Also in this book, we see the return of Olivia Ryan. Why did we not hear about Olivia Ryan before? Don't ask too many questions. Olivia Ryan returns from getting her second nose job. Again, she is 12. She starts to develop a friendship with Alicia. Kristen and Dylan eventually find out that Darrington is actually just using them so that he can get closer to Massey. But Massey likes Cam Fisher, but so does Claire. Things get pretty spicy when Cam and Claire win a dance competition and Claire gives Cam the prize gift of an iTunes gift card. We all know what an iTunes gift card means. Massey was, of course, able to convince the principal that the school should have a competition to see what the new uniforms would be. And the teams would compete in a fashion show with the winner getting a Teen Vogue photo shoot and picking the uniform for the school. Massey and Claire end up being partnered up together. Enemies to lovers? No, just friends, but they do work together and end up getting the most votes for their uniforms. Unfortunately, Alicia and Olivia have partnered up and are so desperate to win that they switch the voting boxes and Alicia and Olivia end up winning the Teen Vogue photo shoot. It's Arizona all over again. For the three Republicans watching me, that that was a joke. I'm not on your side. Massey finds out about this and swears revenge on Alicia. Book three, Revenge of the Wannabes. Revenge of the Wannabes most importantly confirms that Massey is a July Leo, but we all knew that. After leading her dance class, Alicia, full of confidence, decides to break away from the pretty committee and form a rival committee with her new bestie, Olivia Ryan. This is of course called the Unbelievably Pretty Committee. You really couldn't have thought of a different name there, huh? And Alicia also flirts with Cam Fisher's older brother, Harris. Harris is in high school, Alicia is 12, and according to the Click Wiki, his favorite song is Barely Legal by The Strokes. Alicia, I also dated someone with a not dissimilar age gap, and I can just say, 
run. While Claire and Cam's burgeoning relationship develops, Massey says that Claire must dump Cam if Claire wants a spot on the Pretty Committee. Claire, of course, being a sheep and spineless, does so. Massey and the Pretty Committee then sabotage Alicia and Olivia's Teen Vogue photo shoot and reveal that she's a fraud who cheated. Remember that from the last book? Turns out that was important. When Massey learns that Darrington is into her, she decides that Claire can have her boy toy back and gets Cam to take Claire back. Principal Burns agrees not to install the uniforms. Alicia gets dumped by her predator boyfriend and her click falls apart. With nowhere to go, Alicia comes crawling back and the pretty committee is formed with Alicia, Claire, Massey, Kristen, and Dylan together. Book four, Invasion of the Boy Snatchers. Alicia's cousin Nina arrives from Spain to spend a spring semester at OCD. Massey and Claire grow closer when Claire's father announces that he may be accepting a job in Chicago and moving away. This is of course because they always want what they don't have and because they're gay. But also Massey deserves better than Claire, so I don't know about that. Massey dislikes Nina and immediately feels threatened as Nina quickly becomes the most popular girl in school. Nina also convinces Claire that Cam actually doesn't like her. Now, Massey dislikes Nina immediately because she's a foreigner. I mean, because she's the most popular girl in school now. When Nina flirts with the Pretty Committee's crushes, the Pretty Committee decides it's time to get rid of her. Dylan grabs the knife and Kristen begins deactivating the security cameras. No, I'm kidding. But they do reveal that she's a kleptomaniac and Nina is so embarrassed that she's forced to return to Spain in shame. Well, at least they have free health care in Spain, Nina. Meanwhile, Claire is so upset that Cam may not like her that she decides to kiss Alicia's crush, Josh. Cam sees this and breaks up with her. Claire is a monster. Book five, the Pretty Committee strikes back. The girls go on a class trip to Lake Placid. On the campground, the nearby all boys school, the Briarwood Boys, are just a few cabins away. Massey quickly decides that she is the authority on kissing and creates Muck, or Massey's underground clinic for kissing but secretly admits to Claire that she's actually never kissed someone. So Claire decides to teach Massey by making out with her and they finally discover why there's so much tension between the two. Again, kidding, they're 12 and they don't allow gays in Westchester. But Claire coaches the others and Massey on how to kiss and Massey kisses Darrington in front of everyone to prove her knowledge of kissing. Meanwhile, Claire comes crawling back to Cam, trying to get him back, all while trying to keep from Alicia that she kissed Alicia's crush, Josh. Alicia finds out and then pretends to kiss Cam to make Claire experience how she felt, as she should. But like the healthy couple they are, Claire and Cam are back together. Hashtag clam forever, am I right? Now, unfortunately, because the pretty committee had broken away from the campgrounds to do this kissing experiment, they are discovered and expelled from the school. Book six, dial L for loser. I know that last one left on a wild note, but it just gets weirder from here. So, while expelled from school, Dylan invites the Pretty Committee to the set of the morning talk show that her mother hosts. While on the set of a nearby movie, Dylan overhears that the lead's co-star is sexting the lead's boyfriend, and she accidentally blabs this to where the lead overhears this, becomes so embarrassed, and then quits the movie. But the director, for some reason, is still so impressed by the Pretty Committee that they decide to let all of the girls besides Dylan try out for the lead role as the replacement. To everyone's shock, Claire gets the role and Massey and Alicia quickly become jealous. Claire quickly becomes friends with her co-stars. They're really giving Zendaya and Tom Holland pre-2021 vibes. Massey and Alicia then host a behind the scenes segments to purposely embarrass Claire. They go into her wardrobe and plant hair removal stuff and tampons. Oh no, Claire bleeds? How will the public react to this? And also when Claire has to kiss a hot celebrity for the movie, Massey takes a picture and sends it to Cam. Hashtag clam no more. Naturally, the girls all fight. But eventually, Claire discovers that her co-star friends are actually pulling a Zendaya Tom Holland 2022, and their relationship is totally for PR, and like everyone else, they can't stay in Claire's guts. And so Claire comes crawling back to the pretty committee. Meanwhile, Kristen writes an open letter to OCD demanding that they be re-let into the school, and they accept it. Number seven, it's not easy being mean. It's the day before their first day back at OCD, and eighth grade alpha, Sky Hamilton, has a challenge for them. Guy turns up with a CD and tells them of a legendary key that is passed down from the eighth grade alpha to the seventh grade alpha, who automatically becomes the eighth grade alpha when it's passed on. Since it's the fifth anniversary of this tradition, Sky decides to mix things up rather than handing it directly to Massey. She instead gives them a challenge and promises them that this secret room will change their social lives forever. Sky hides the key to a secret room under the mattress of one of the Briarwood boys and gives him a clue in this poem. The boy who sleeps atop the key is into the exact same things as me. He loves all creatures, big and small, so his age doesn't matter, not at all. I try not to think about his glamour don't style by focusing on his kick butt smile. Note to self, I've kissed this guy 
but I've kissed them all. How bad am I? We've already rode off in the sunset together, but next time we do, it will be forever. Holla! Also, their reinstatement to OCD requires the girls who participate in the soccer team. They show up to soccer practice and have decorated their soccer uniforms in pretty committee style. The soccer coach responds to this by making the girls take off their uniforms and practice in towels. Meanwhile, Claire goes to Manhattan to meet with her agent about auditioning for another movie. Her agent offers her a part in a, in a rom-com with Cole Sprouse, where she would be a runaway girl who falls in love with a prince and becomes a princess. However, Claire is hesitant because the role would require her to cut her hair, dye it black, and get a bushy monobrow with sewed-on goat hair. <laughs> What's weird is, like, <laughs> she's apparently supposed to do this just for the audition, where, like, the role isn't even guaranteed. So I understand her hesitation. And of course, Claire gets kicked out of the pretty committee again, but who cares? Alicia tries to help Claire get the key by giving her a list of all the boys that Skye has kissed before. Claire ends up finding the key under the boy's bed. A character I haven't mentioned before, but if you've seen the movies you're familiar with, Lane. Claire is friends with Lane and she's kind of like the, um, oh, what's her name in Mean Girls? She's like the Janet in Mean Girls. Claire is like kind of friends with her, but the second she gets let back into the com pretty committee, she immediately ditches her. So like she's in these books, but Lane is not really irrelevant. But anyways, Lane and Claire become friends again and they discover that the key is actually under Lane's older brother's mattress. And so Claire immediately finds the key ditches Lane and uses the key to get back into the pretty committee with Massey and the book ends with Skye revealing what is in the secret room. Book eight, sealed with a diss. All right, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't even finish that, that first drink of Sandra's, but I've switched over to our second Sandra cocktail. Um, this is just red wine, peach schnapps, and the rest of that seltzer water, so. It's actually really good. Oh, it's really good. Thank you, Sandra. We recovered on that one. So we find out that the secret room is an unused storm cellar, but Sky has tricked us once again. The room is actually useless until we find out that there's another secret hidden in the room. Sky says the secret will change their social lives forever. In order to get the secret, they must get a date for Sky for Sky's party, and they must all get dates for themselves again to bring to Sky's party. So basically they all have to go to her party. If they don't do this, Skye will not show them the cool thing that will change their lives forever. Luckily they do and they find out that the prize is actually a HIPAA violation. <laughs> yes, it turns out that a previous alpha put a camera inside a teddy bear and called it Share Bear and he gave it to the Briarwood boys. You know, the boys across the, across the street in the all boys school. And she put this teddy bear inside their therapy room where they do their group therapy sessions. Yes, that's right. And so the girls have now gained access to their private group therapy sessions and can use the information in them to emotionally manipulate them, presumably into giving them <laughs> favors. Luckily, this doesn't last too long. The camera eventually breaks and the girls have to break into the Briarwood school to try and repair the teddy bear. How do I put this in a concise way that conveys what happens? Um, so they break into the school, try and fix the camera. They accidentally damage a pipe while they're breaking in and they end up flooding the entire Briarwood school. Um, and then the Briarwood boys now have to spend the rest of the semester at OCD while the school is repaired. And Massey gets upset because in her view, the boys have disrupted the social order and have become alphas. So she decides to go full Sister Cindy mode and tell everyone that they must remain celibate until proper order is restored with Massey as the alpha. Yes, this has nothing to do with the fact that Darrington also leaves Massey because he wants to be with older girls. Book nine, Bratfist at Tiffany's. The girls are all single again and they've decided that they are now the new Pretty Committee, or NPC, which is the least girl boss acronym I think they could have used. They're still on their Sister Cindy bit, or boy fast, as they call it, but as purity culture never works, they all become very repressed and horny for various boys. Eventually, they decide to end the boy fast and instead hire a PR consultant to get Massey back to her rightful place as Alpha. No, that is not a joke. That's how the book ends.
Okay, so these next five books are the summer novellas. They're basically like if this was a TV show, like a bottle episode, describing what each of these five girls get into between the summer of seventh and eighth grade. Massey. Massey's summer gets off to a rough start when she's kicked out of horse camp. She's kicked out of horse camp because she attempted to glue the butt of another girl to her horse's saddle. Upset with this, her parents tell her to get a job. So Massey decides to join an MLM. Yes, Massey finds out that the top members of this company have all have a purple streak in their hair. And this purple streak is so famous that when sales consultants see it, they recognize it and will give them priority access to designer sales of things like Gucci bags and other designer things that I totally know. So what I love about Massey is that she is not about exploiting the labor of others. She does not want to get anybody in her downline, but she will emotionally abuse you into buying her products. Yes, she becomes the top seller at this company by telling women that they are so ugly that if they do not buy her products, they are valueless as women. When the CEO finds out that this is how she became the top seller, the CEO tells Massey that she's fired, but Massey, being the queen that she is, says that she's actually taking this time to retire. And of course, on her way out, she has actually stolen the hair dye that makes the purple streak, so she gets the purple streak anyways. I truly don't understand how a purple streak of hair can be identifiable to the point where a consultant would rely on that because anyone can get a purple streak in their hair, especially when these books were published. I mean, did they not have a Claire's nearby? Do Claire's not exist in Westchester? I don't know, don't make me unpack this. This is the summer. Dylan. Dylan spends her summer in Hawaii with her TV host mom. Her mom is assigned to cover the big tennis championship that is going on in Hawaii at the time. One of the teen tennis sensations there is Svetlana Slusigit is Svetlana Slutskia, or Tennis the Menace, who happens to have an uncontrollable temper. Dylan and Svetlana do not get along initially, but Dylan needs Svetlana's help to get the attention of her crush, JT, another tennis player. Svetlana eventually humiliates Dylan in front of JT, and Dylan retaliates by getting Svetlana to throw such a bad temper that she is kicked out of the open competition and sent to therapy. Dylan doesn't even end up with JT. She then starts dating the male champion, Brady. I mean, at least Svetlana got therapy. Alicia. Alicia goes to Spain and is in a music video. Kristen. Kristen spends her summer tutoring a boy named Ripple and has a crush on his older brother, Dune. But Dune unfortunately likes the eighth grade alpha, Sky Hamilton. So Kristen decides to organize a new clique, the Witty Committee. The Witty Committee help her get Sky out of her way so she can get her man, Dune. They find out that Dune is going to teach Skye how to swim. And so they naturally fill the country club pool with Jello. This works and Dune and Kristen get together. I totally forgot to put Claire's summer book in here because I don't like Claire. Okay, so like Claire goes back to Florida and then discovers that her friends from Florida don't like her because no one likes her. And then she's like, oh my gosh, you've changed. And then Claire is like, oh, I'm pretty committee. All right, that's Claire's book, moving on. <laughs> book 10, I Loathe You. Lane is back into the picture. Lane and Massey both have a crush on the new boy, Dempsey. And Kristen is like, oh my gosh, a love triangle which side will I pick? And then Dempsey flirts with Kristen and Kristen likes the first man that gives her attention. I understand, Kristen, I understand. Massey starts a cheerleading squad to have an excuse to get close to Dempsey while he's practicing soccer. Massey's cheer squad is called the Sock Hers, which I can't defend Massey on that one. And then Massey becomes so bossy about the choreography that Alicia forms her own rival squad, the Hartnets? I just got that it's supposed to be the harlots, like it's a pun on the harlots, but they're 13 and harlots isn't like a sporting reference. I don't know. Meanwhile, do you remember Darrington, Massey's ex? Well, Dylan and Darrington get into detention and start to bond. Dylan finds out that Darrington not only likes the Jonas Brothers, he likes her too. She initially thinks that Darrington is interested in another girl, but it turns out to be his sister. So Darrington kisses Dylan at a soccer game. They start to go out behind Massey's back until Massey invites Dylan to her pool party where Dylan decides to take Darrington with her. Dylan then tells Massey that she's dating Darrington and Massey responds by pushing both Darrington and Dylan into the pool, as she should. Betrayed by her friends, Massey disbands the pretty committee and her only friend at this point is Claire. This is certainly Massey's worst point in the franchise. Book 11, 
Boys Are Us, Alicia forms the first boy-girl clique, the Briarwood Octavian Country Day Schools, or B-O-C-D, also called the Soulmates. Meanwhile, Massey hires a group of look-alike models to pretend to be her friends in her new squad. Yep, she's going full Taylor Swift 2015. They are brought and brung. Claire is forced to choose between Massey and the soulmates as they have different access to different parties. Yeah, don't think about who you value more as a person, Claire. Now, eventually, Alicia realizes that boys are dumb and hard to boss around, and Massey discovers that hiring models as your friends isn't as good as the real thing. So the two make up and the pretty committee is reunited. Also in this book, we meet Landon. The important thing about Landon is that he has a black pug named Bark Obama. Bark Obama is briefly the boyfriend of Massey's dog, Bean, who is also a black pug. Bean will frequently lick pictures of Bark Obama and want to play with him frequently, although Bark does not seem to return her affections. Book 12, Charmed and Dangerous. Now this is actually a prequel to the original Click series, and it gives us nothing. Would you believe prior to the Click that Massey is a beta, Alicia is a dancer girl, Dylan body checks for the first time, and Kristen is on that babysitting grind. Four girls get together and realize they should rule the school. Oh, and Claire almost gets a kiss from the leader of a boy band and dreams of being popular someday. I have a feeling this prequel was written entirely by Claire. Book 13, These Boots Are Made For Stalking. Back to the main timeline. Massey has a crush on ninth grader Landon, who, as I mentioned previously, has a black pug named Bark Obama. Landon is a ninth grader. Massey says that they should all have a crush on ninth graders. But Claire still has a crush on Cam, who is age appropriate, notably in her grade. Alicia also has a crush on a ninth grader because she realizes that her current crush, Josh, wears the same size clothes as her, and this is apparently a turnoff, which Bestie. Y'all are 12, 13. Give him a month and he will be like a foot taller than you. I don't know what to expect. Book 14, My Little Phony. Jail for that title. Um, the reasons aren't too important, but the pretty committee have all individually been banned from shopping. After Massey pranks Claire, Claire and Massey get into a fight and Claire swears revenge. Meanwhile, Massey is worried about her inexperience when she wants to kiss Landon, her ninth grade boyfriend. To Massey's horror, she actually ends up kissing Landon in front of his grandparents, a fate I do not wish upon my worst enemies. Things get worse when Massey returns home and her father reveals that he is filing for bankruptcy and has lost all of the family money. If your dad says that he lost his job and that is resulting in you losing all of your money, um. He didn't just lose his job. It's either he did something so horribly offensive to get fired <laughs> that he couldn't get any sort of reference to get potential new work, or he was scamming the entire time and y'all were never really rich in the first place. Nevertheless, things are looking bleak as we go into our final book, A Tale of Two Pretties. Yeah, it actually turns out that the real alpha this entire time was the author, Lisey Harrison. In the foreword of the final book, Lisey writes, I wanted to show you how despicable bullying, snobbery, and elitism are by creating a character, Massey Block, who worked tirelessly and often heartlessly to maintain her alpha status. Yes, this entire series was satire. Oh, you kids thought the main character was good because you're children and can't understand what satire is? Lisey, you knew. You knew this entire time that I was falling for it. In the final book, Claire encourages Massey to come forward to the group that her family is broke, but the group is all experiencing wide amounts of change. Dylan, who has previously never mentioned having siblings, is apparently starting a reality show to rival the Kardashians with her sisters. Kristen is joining an elite soccer team, and Alicia has visited a psychic who predicted that Alicia will become the alpha. Massey's father has announced that he found a new job, but the job requires him and the family to move to London. Upon hearing that her family is moving to London, Massey is given the option to either stay in Westchester with her friends or move out on her own. So Massey decides to visit the psychic Alicia had previously seen and the psychic recommends that she move to London. Massey announces her move to the group and appoints Alicia as the next alpha. Claire and her family have also finally saved up enough money to buy a house of their own, and they announce that they're leaving the block guest house. As the girls embark on their high school journey, they vow to remain friends. Also in this book, uh, Cam, 
Lane, Darrington, and Harris, remember him, form a band called the Garage Band, and Cam sings a song called Gummy Claire, where he mentions his love for Claire. The movie. The movie's cute. I liked the pretty outfits. It was straight to DVD, but it was produced by Warner Brothers and Tyra Banks. And the actresses had also said that there were plans for two more movies, but it just like never happened, which is odd because it did seem like a pretty successful movie, even for a straight to DVD project. But this was before the era of like prestige miniseries. And I feel like this series was just meant to be in miniseries form. But if it was made today, it would be like baby euphoria because HBO definitely owns the rights to it. And it would still be produced by Drake. So I don't know if I'd actually want that today. But the movie's cute. It's very camp and it, it doesn't take itself too seriously, which I think is always good. Also, no one mentions that Clay is in this movie. Was this his 13th reason? But I have to admit, I didn't see this movie when it first came out because I saw the trailer and the trailer made a change to a line in the original book that enraged me so much that I did not trust this movie to be faithful to the book, which it turns out this movie is almost like line by line true to the original book, except for some of these critical moments. So the trailer shows portions of the sleepover scenes in the original Click book. Claire is invited to the Pretty Committee sleepover and the Pretty Committee frequently will ask, would you rather questions? So they pose a question, would you rather have a bunch of friends, but they secretly hate you? Or would you rather be a friendless loser? Now, the Pretty Committee all feel insecure about their relationships. They feel insecure about how they're perceived and they just want to be liked. Even though they're all friends with each other, they all secretly fear that the other ones hate them. And so out of insecurity, they lie and say that they would rather be a friendless loser. But Claire, at this point in the first book, doesn't have any friends, real or fake. So she says that she would rather have a bunch of fake friends who secretly hate them. Because in her mind, at least pretending that she's liked is better than not being liked at all. Now in the movie, they decide to completely flip this around and Claire says that she would rather be a friendless loser, which completely defeats the point of this scene and arguably the point of this entire franchise. The entire point is that they are both two sides of the same coin. They're both in they are all incredibly lonely. They just want to be liked and seen and valued by their friends and they don't know how to get it. And I don't know why the movie writers would have made this change other than the fact that maybe they didn't trust the young middle schooler audience to realize that fake friends is also a bad thing. And so they flipped it around to be like, it's better to have real friendships than not real friendships, which yes, is true, but was like, one level on like the 10 levels that the click books were trying to push. You know what I mean? The clictionary. All right, day two, I'm back and my hair is maybe less chaotic today. I don't know, we'll see. It's been doing this really cute thing where it like falls out of my head and then it grows straight vertically when it comes back in. So that's nice. Today, Sandra has blessed us with a cantaloupe martini and you guessed it. It's a lot of vodka, uh, cantaloupe juice, lemon, lime, sugar, and like melon liqueur. It's mostly vodka as most martinis are. But I, the reason I had to do this video in two parts specifically was because I was waiting for this glorious thing to come in. I couldn't justify buying all of the books for this one video, but I just, I had to have this. So this is the Clictionary. So this is your guide to all things the click. Any information that you need to know is contained within these like 90 pages. I don't know, they're not numbered. But as soon as I got this in the mail, I knew it was well worth my purchase of like $4. First of all, I love the cover. The cover is beautiful. It has a fun little interactive spinny wheel where you can learn some of the terms. I've already gotten distracted by this book. Okay, this is what I forgot to say. So one of the things I loved about the Click series, and I think a lot of people loved about the Click series, is it was famous for having a lot of acronyms, a lot of comebacks, a lot of code words that really defined the series. And it was like a, a language in itself. And some of it was like iconic and other parts of it were just terrible. But all of it pretty much has been saved to the Clictionary, which was published in 2009, so before the series had ended. 
but it was still like a decent chunk of the click books were out. And I am so sad for my childhood self because I did not know that this existed when I was a wee lass trying to be a click member. So let's walk through this together. First of all, before we even get to the foreword, one of the first page, you know, that has like the publication information that's in every book, it says that Beth McGregor is the winner of the comeback contest, but um, it says see Beth's comeback on page 56 and the pages are not numbered in this book. So I don't, I, I don't know which comeback is Beth's. I really don't. We'll be taking our best educated bet. I do have to critique it for that other than it being a, a perfect, perfect book in every other way. I did want to mention the foreword. I know I mentioned the foreword in the final book as well, but I thought that this was genuinely like really sweet. So Lisey Harrison wrote, some people, mostly the young or insane, have imaginary friends. Well, I have five, Massey, Alicia, Dylan, Kristen, and Claire. Their high-pitched voices and girly giggles resonate inside my head like that post-concert ear ringing you get from standing too close to the speaker. Only this never fades. For years, I have been dressing them, talking to them, listening to them, and laughing with them. I try to teach them life lessons, but they don't always learn. I fix them up with crushes, yet they're constantly getting crushed. I remind them to accept themselves, but as we all know, that's a hard skill to master. Sometimes I think about everything the pretty committee has been through, but all I see is a swirl of colorful book covers. So how does one relive all the good times without rereading every book? A clictionary. In these pages, I've gathered the things I want to remember most from the series, and now I want to share them with you, the real living, breathing girls who inspire me the most, Lisey Harrison. I did look it up. Lisey is how you pronounce her name. It's interesting because I feel like when you read a series like this, you wouldn't necessarily expect there to be a very passionate writer behind this because like she was directed by Alloy Entertainment to write this series. And whether she is genuine or not, it does seem like she really had this idea for this like satire that was approaching women's issues and tween drama in this unique way. I can see how most people who read her books would not see that she had that intention because it is very subtle, arguably too subtle for the message to come across. But Lisey is like an incredibly interesting person. I would love to have a conversation with Lisey someday. Anyways, the book gets off to some quizzes to discover which member of the clique we are. So the first quiz is, are you a Claire or are you a Massey? Now, they kind of set us up for failure because Massey is one option, but then you can either be a Claire or a Lane on top of that. And are we surprised? I got Lane. And it's a surprise to me, I got called out by the quiz result. But Lanes, hear this out. Sometimes you take yourselves and your opinions a little too seriously, and you end up cutting yourself off from people who are actually a lot cooler than you might think. So here's a word of advice whether you want it or not. Make your point, but don't stab anyone with it. Lisey, I wish you had told this to me when I was 13, when I actually thought I was cool, and now I just think I'm a piece of stuff on a rock in space. But moving on, the other quiz is, are you an Alicia, a Dylan, or a Kristen? And again, there's another plot twist um, where another option is, why you, which means that you're perfectly happy being you. And if you got Dylan, I'm a little concerned about you. Well, I mean, half of the Dylan answers to these quizzes are what I talked about before, like the weird pro Anna thin spo stuff. But then the other half are like jokes about IBS, which I very much relate to. So I like tied between basically all the characters when I took this quiz. But my favorite question from this quiz that I had to include was, you put the B in brains beauty and boobs too. Let's not forget the boobs. Body issues <laughs> or being yourself. Comment down below which one you put the B into. Yeah, these quizzes were surprisingly more insightful than I was expecting. I did not expect to get roasted by uh, a clictionary book, but there we are. And the next section is like profiles of the different click girls. And it's, it's mostly boring, but every now and then there's just like a juicy little morsel. Like for Massey's, I didn't even mention it in my recap of the book because it's literally not relevant to the plot. Matthew lists her first lip kiss easy, Darrington. Now tell the truth. Fine, it was Todd Lyons, okay? I was tricked. It was a total apocalypse. Yeah, so Todd Lyons is Claire's younger brother and he's played by the Wallows boy, Dylan Minnette, in, in the movies. And in the books, he is like a total pervert. Like there's one book where he definitely installs a shower, a shower cam to like spy on Massey naked. And then in the second book, he like, Massey has her eyes closed and he pecks her. I did feel the need to read the text from after Massey, reve Massey realizes what's happened. Seconds later, he was gone and he made off with a lot more than Cam's gift. 
because on November 6th, at exactly 4.17 p.m., Todd Lyons had stolen Massey Block's first kiss, and unfortunately, she'd never get it back. And if you want to say your first kiss was Darrington Massey, I fully support you. But the one profile that really gets me is, of course, Dylan. She is apparently best known for her red hair, famous mom, and excess of gas. Same. Most of these things are related to her, um, ED, clearly. And then her favorite diet is the stomach flu. It's like, I don't even care if it's satire. Like, this is just full-on tacky to me. What I like more is Alicia's best known, apparently, for her GAB, which stands for Gossip and Big Boobs. We like big boobs. This book also includes a lot of the iconic click quotes, and, you know, some of them are better than others. No one loves inner beauty more than unattractive wannabes. Massey. Ugly people should stay indoors. Also for Massey. Kristen does give some actual advice. She says, always add a third coat of Clarins SPF 30. The first two protect your fair skin from the sun's harmful rays. The third keeps the pollution out. You know, no matter your skin tone, you gotta be safe out there. So I support that at least. And Nina makes, I would say, the most important quote. She says, guys love it when you blow big bubbles. It reminds them of boobs. And of course, because Claire is Claire, Claire has this quote about friendship. If friends were houses, I'd be homeless. As you should, Claire. <laughs> the book also includes a very helpful heart chart, which I wish I had had at the beginning of this video because it would have made it a whole lot easier. I'll put it up on the screen for you. But what I love is that because the book um, printed this on two pages, it kind of looks like Claire and Sky dated slash it's very hard to tell who people are dating from like other pages because the lines just kind of don't add up the way it's it's set out. But I love it. I love that it's more confusing. And then of course we have the glorious section, the comeback section. Most of these comebacks are iconic. Great, love them. Um, not all of them, which I don't know which one of these were created by Beth. Like this one, I, I really have to question. Penelope, are you a big boob? No. Then why are you hanging? Or this one. Claire, do I look like a sled? No. Then why are you coming down on me? No comment. I really like the coma one. Are we in a coma? Then why do you think we're gonna take this line down? And I assume that this is Beth's winning comeback because it's in yellow and the rest of them are all just in normal text. But it says, um, Alicia, is my name V? Then why would I follow you? It's not the worst. It's, it's, I wouldn't say it's the best. And then at the very end, we have a clictionary where it gives important definitions to all the, the lingo you need to know in these books um, that I've referenced a little bit throughout this. One of my favorites is they have a section dedicated to C cups. Alicia's larger than average bra size or clam, which I thought was the couple name I made for Claire and Cam, but apparently I forgot it also stood for cute, loyal, athletic, and middle class. The Nintendo DS video game. Okay, I never played this as a kid. I wish I had because I definitely did have a DS at this time and I would have loved playing this. According to the description, players will use gossip, fashion, and wit to make friends, join cliques, attend classes, and even work after school jobbies with a variety of exciting mini games. Play a variety of exciting mini games to earn cash or increase your cool. I did watch like one of the only playthroughs that are available online. And I I love it. I love it. I wish I had some way to just like emulate it and play it on Twitch or something. I would totally do that because it looks iconic. Like it's basically a school simulator, but in between school, you're supposed to be going and getting yourself into basically every click in the school. And the way you do that is by running errands for all of these clicks and also by spreading gossip points. The only way I can like explain to you how the game works is by simulating the experience. Okay, so let's pretend for a second that you're the NPC, I am the main character, of course. And I will come up to you after just completing a side quest, okay? <sighs> hey Sally, here's your math homework that you asked for. By the way, did you hear that Kelly's parents are getting divorced? Oh my god, no way, be a part of our party. I would play that for hours if I had the opportunity. So I guess now after all this time, I have to get into my overall thoughts of the franchise. Now, these books aren't aren't high art, I wouldn't say. Um, it's definitely not something you read in AP literature class. But I remember a couple weeks ago when I was doing research, I discovered this New York Times article 
That was basically describing the author's experience about how the click books made her hate women and love materialism and blah, 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 blah. And I strongly disagree. Like, don't get me wrong. A lot of the stuff did not age well, especially Dylan's eating disorder. And I did get some weird insecurities about things that I probably would have gotten from other places, but I did get from the click books. But I think the premise about it being about rich, popular girls is a little bit misleading in that it, it lends itself to making really shallow literary analysis of it and not really looking at what it actually did to the people who enjoyed these books. I mean, throughout these books, I think you realize that the popular girls aren't as different from the regular girls or even the loser girls, that every single character in this in these books, whether no matter how rich they are, no matter how cool you may think they are, are incredibly insecure and are dealing with issues in their family and are dealing with boy drama and how they're perceived just like every other teen girl is. And I think the point of the book, whether it was like successfully achieved is arguable, but I think the point of the book was to show girls like myself, girls who felt like a Claire, girls who felt like Elaine, that the popular girls didn't have some secret code unlocked that we didn't know about, that they were like just like us and this sort of weird social structure we'd all built for ourselves was just, you know, like a facade. I think these books taught a lot more about empathy for flawed characters than a lot of other media does. Even though I don't think a book about rich New York Westchester girls was intended to be super relatable, I do think it speaks to a lot of the complexities of just being a middle school girl. You know, middle school girls are kind of selfish and dramatic and they tend to make poor choices and don't learn from their mistakes in the same way as adults do. And I think in a lot of ways these books are realistic. These characters aren't making decisions like adults because they're not adults. And it doesn't waste time on a lot of the more modern trends of giving them all tragic backstories so that we have a reason to feel bad for them rather than just looking at how they are and how they act in the world. Like it just goes into the relationship between these girls and I just feel like that's a topic that's so rarely explored and so I think it's really interesting the way that Lisi does it even though I don't necessarily think it's successful all the time. And of course by 2022 standards it definitely doesn't hold up on the diversity point. There's basically no POC queer people, disabled people, anything other than white, rich ladies. And yes, I know this was Westchester, New York, but I looked it up. Westchester, New York only has about 50% all white people. The rest are all people of color, people from mixed backgrounds, people who have different experiences. And you're telling me they didn't interact with any of them of significance? It's doubtful. And also, as I've mentioned before, the weirdness around Alicia's heritage, Dylan's body issues, the fact that so much of these plots were driven by very heterosexual boy-girl drama. But at the end of the day, I think a lot of books like the Click franchise get discounted because they're seen as frivolous, because they're not realistic, because they're not relatable. Regardless of what it of what it teaches people, what you get out of the click book. Unambiguously, a lot of people enjoyed this media and they saw enough in these girls to read all the way up until the end of their story. And you know, maybe it is sometimes that we just want to be like, no thoughts, head empty, look at the pretty girls in dresses and wonder about their frivolous problems. And I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's bad to not to choose to engage in media that's light and doesn't require a lot of thought. No one has a problem with boys being obsessed with the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Like, if you think about it, it's just as silly of a concept. And if you applied it to reality, it wouldn't necessarily be the best representation of a lot of life lessons we want to teach to people. But you still enjoy it and we're allowed to enjoy things even if it's not a perfect piece of media. And you know, for myself, I think these books taught me to be creative and funny and it taught me to not be so scared of like the cool girls in school. And I don't know, I think I am just curious as to whether this book, these books would have been made today and how different they would have been if they'd been made today. Because I, for one, am, am glad that I had these books growing up. And it's been really fun just getting to dive back into memory lane. Um, rather than doing all of the things I have to do this week. Let me know your thoughts, thoughts and opinions. And also, um, I said at the beginning of this video, we've got over a thousand subscribers now. I have a community tab. I have the whole shebang. And um, I just wanted to thank everyone who's been watching. I've wanted to make YouTube videos for a really long time. And I think I was always really scared of how people would perceive me. And I finally decided to like not let the fear of like really hypothetical 
non-existent problems stop me from enjoying hobbies that I genuinely enjoy. I've been watching YouTube for a really long time and so it's really fun to be on the other side of it and talking about the things that give me joy and, and getting to be creative and not having to worry about all the serious stuff that, that is going on outside of all of this. So I hope I've been a good distraction for you because it's been like the world to me. Thank you so much. I will be back with another video in the future. And if you liked this video, feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and I will see y'all in the next one. Bye!